Defense, the final step stage on the movable feast that is the uh, Dulles at 100 conference. Um, welcome to all of those of you who have been a part of our day-long conference and those of you who may have just joined us for this evening's events. Um, I just want to, I'm briefly going to uh, welcome you all and introduce the evening and then turn it over to Father Matt Malone of the Society of Jesus. But I just want to, um, again, thank, I'm the director of the Center on Religion and Culture, but we are just one of several sponsors of today's uh, conference. Among them are the uh, Curran Center for American Catholic Studies, the Fordham Department of Theology, the office of the president of Fordham University, Father McShane, who spoke today at our uh, wonderful keynote by Beth Johnson, the office of the provost of Fordham University, and also the Fordham, the Jesuit community of Fordham University, and a special thanks to Father Tom Shergi and the, the, the Jesuit community here, the true animators of the mission of our university. And on a personal level, animators of indeed my own conversion to the Catholic Church under the guidance of the Jesuits. And that is the one thing I have in common with Avery Dulles. <laughs> it ends there. There is nothing else. Again, welcome to you all. And I'm going to turn it over now to our other co-sponsor, America Media and its president, Father Matt Malone. My brothers and sisters, good evening, and uh, my thanks to uh, David Gibson and the Center for Religion and Culture uh, and for Fordham University for sponsoring this event uh, and for the warm welcome to this evening's discussion. Uh, as, as Dave said, I'm the editor-in-chief of America Magazine, and uh, it's really a great consolation to stand before you tonight and uh, at this conference that celebrates a man um, that we knew at America as a professor, as a theologian, as a writer, a Jesuit, a cardinal, um, and most importantly, as a friend. In his nearly six decades of t teaching, Avery Dulles proved himself not only a giant in the classroom and the, cath and the uh, Catholic circles, but really in all of academia. Um, he was, as you know, the first uh, American theologian to become a cardinal, and, uh, and really the first uh, author in America's pages to be named a cardinal. <laughs> um, and these, uh, these writings and, and reflections continue to provide us with what I think are the foundational methods for thinking about the church and how uh, best to think with the church. Uh, America Magazine first welcomed the byline of Avery Dulles in 1951, though he was not the first Dulles to appear in our pages. That was his father, John Foster Dulles who predated him by just a few months, and I suspect that his son had something to do with that. While Avery was a, a prodigious writer throughout his life, appearing in numerous journals and publications, nearly 80 entries appear in the archives of America over a period of 60 years. In many ways, America was the public home for his thought. And in celebration of that reality, that great gift to uh, America and to the church, I'm pleased to announce that uh, America Magazine, in commemorating the 100th anniversary of the birth of Cardinal Dulles, has launched a special web page that includes writings by and about Cardinal Dulles, which will be periodically updated throughout this year of celebration. And those attending tonight should have received cards or something to this effect with the information to access those materials, but you can find them. Um, at americamagazine.org forward slash Cardinal Avery Dulles 100. Um, and uh, those watching along on the live stream can, can do likewise. It is an extraordinary body of work uh, to match an extraordinary life that was filled with scholarship and compassion and most importantly, with faith. And we are proud to help preserve his legacy. At this time, I'd just like to welcome Dr. Christine Firahinze, director of the Francis and Anne Curran Center for American Catholic Studies at Fordham University, to introduce this evening's speakers. Thank you, and enjoy. Thank 
Thank you, Father Malone. Well, as you heard, my name is Christine Fearhinsey. I'm a professor of theology, and I direct the Francis and Ann Curran Center for American Catholic Studies, one of the number of uh, wonderful groups that are co-hosting tonight that you heard about a minute ago. We've been deeply gratified at the roster of truly distinguished scholars from around the world who have gathered here today to reflect on Card Cardinal Dulles' life and work. And we're also thrilled that all of you are here to participate. I truly believe that within the mysterious bonds of the communion of saints, something that I spoke with Father Dulles about uh, more than once, I was a student at Catholic U and then also here at Fordham, I truly believe that within those bonds, Avery is also present with us tonight, and we hope he is enjoying this scholarly birthday celebration. This evening, for our culminating event, we're honored to have with us two stars of the post-Vatican II Catholic theological fir firmament. Professor Peter Fan of Georgetown University and Professor Joseph Kamanchak, Emeritus Professor of Religious Studies at Catholic University. For many years, Father, Father Kamanchak was on the same faculty with um, Avery Dulles. And um, in both cases, we're going to have the gift of hearing from two superb scholars who are deeply familiar both with Dulles the scholar and also familiar with Dulles the person. So we welcome and thank you for being here. In a moment, I'll briefly introduce our, both of our speakers. Then Professor Fan will offer his plenary address, speaking for about 40, 45 minutes. Immediately following that, Father Kamanchek has agreed kindly to offer some brief reflections of his own on the person, achievement, and legacy of Avery Cardinal Dulles, offering some responses to Peter's presentation. We'll then invite some conversation um, between the two of you, um, in, interspersed with some questions we hope you will provide for us, um, writing on the index cards that you, will be uh, available to you. They're not on the seats, but they're going to be, uh, we're going to have students in the aisle, graduate students with uh, index cards and pencils. So if you'd like to write a question down, um, please just gesture to them and they will give you a card um, and then return the card to them. And we'll pose to, to our speakers as many of your questions as we have time, as time permits within, the, within our time frame. Now to introduce um, more formally our two speakers. I'll start by saying it's a measure of their stature that both of them are recipients of the prestigious John Courtney Murray Award for Distinguished Lifetime Achievement bestowed annually by the Catholic Theological Society of America for which they have both as well served as president. Peter C. Fan has learned, earned three doctorates, and he's currently the inaugural holder of the Ignacio A. Correa Chair of Catholic Social Thought at Georgetown University. He was born in Vietnam and emigrated as a refugee to the United States in 1975. He's a prolific scholar who has authored or edited over 30 books and over 300 articles. Makes me tired just to say that. Um, translated into over a dozen languages on subjects including patristic theology, eschatology, the history of Christian missions in Asia, liberation, enculturation, interreligious dialogue, and global Christianity. Joseph Kamanchek has been a priest of the Archdiocese of New York by my count for 55 years. He's a well-known professor of ecclesiology, and for almost four decades, he held the Hubbard Chair of Religious Studies at the Catholic University of America, teaching and publishing widely on subjects including ecclesiology, modern Catholic theology, and his specialty, the history and theology of Vatican II. Among his innumerable scholarly contributions, Father Kamanchek is the chief editor of the New Dictionary of Theology, and the editor of the English edition of the massive five-volume History of Vatican II. Please join me now in welcoming Professors Fan and Kamanchak, beginning with Professor Fan, whose address is entitled, Imaging the Church in the Age of Migration, the Legacy of Avery Dulles for Asian Christianity. I am deeply grateful to Professor Christine Farah Hinze 
and the organizer of the Dollars at 100 conference for the kind invitation to be part of the celebration of Avery Dollars' centenary of his birth. It is, of course, a great honor for anyone to be invited to speak of the theological achievements and legacy of such a great theologian. There is, for me, an additional personal reason. When Avery Dulles retired from the Catholic University of America in 1988, I was hired to take over some of his teaching duties. One of the courses I inherited from Dulles was called Theological Epistemology. That's a big name. <laughs> so I changed it to a more understandable term, Contemporary Theological Methods. Though, of course, I copy many of his themes, so, you know, different title, but it's more or less the same thing. I am therefore deeply grateful for the opportunity to honor him tonight. There are four themes in my presentation. Avery Dulles' theological legacy, contemporary ecclesiology, global migration, and Asian Christianities. I intend to explore how these four issues impact each other. At first blush, they seem to be remote from each other, especially given the fact that global migration and Asian Christianities were barely on Carter Dulles' theological radar. However, in spite and perhaps because of the lack of prima facie connections among these four topics, bringing them together may yield novel and surprising insight on the way in which the church can meet some of the issues today. To begin with, permit me to relate a true story that illustrates Dulles' connection with Asian Christianity. In the late 1970s, the Jesuits in the Philippines were interested in learning the recent developments in post vatican II ecclesiologies, and who else would qualify to lecture on this, When, so he was invited to lecture, and Dulles agreed, but he said that he would have to obtain the permission of his superior. Very good, Jesuit, you can't do anything without the blessing of the Jesuit, <laughs> which is not true today anymore. <laughs> After a while, he called the provincial office in Manila to tell him that he got permission. The person in the provincial office who took the call was a brother whose English was not very fluent. Dulles told him that he was Avery Dulles, American Jesuit, and that he would come to lecture in Manila. The brother asked him to spell his name, and so Avery Dulles dearfully and distinctly spelled it out. A-V-E-R-Y-D-U-L-E-S. Later, when the brother was asked by the provincial if there had been any call from the United States, he replied, yeah, yeah, there was. And the message was, a very dull American Jesuit will be coming to lecture. <laughs> Later, with self-deprecating humor, Avery Dulles himself began his lecture with this story. So here you have a very close connection between Avery Dulles and Asian Christianity. <laughs> now, the advantage of being the last person to speak at a conference is that everything has been said. Nothing, I mean, to talk about every dollar, to talk about migration, to talk about yin and yang ecclesiology. So at this stage, I am tempted to do what the priest would do at the end of Mass. The conference is ended, go in peace. 
but I can't do that. <laughs> I have three points typically Jesuit to make this evening. The first one is the models of ecclesiology Avery Dallas proposed. I will not go through them because you know all of them, so I will not spend my time doing that. The second part of the paper would talk about migration, global migration as occurred today. Again, I have several pages on it, but again, you can get it from uh, the source of all knowledge, Wikipedia, all right? <laughs> so I will be very quick on that. I'll spend all my time on the third part to try to develop a model of church as a migrant community, the church of, for, by the migrants. So that's all my, so you are spared the first two parts very quickly. Now of the first part, I'd like to point out only three things. Agnes Brazal this afternoon talked about six criteria of a good model according to Avery Dulles. I maintain, I just focus on three. For a good model of theology, it has to be both explanatory and exploratory. Explanatory meaning that a model can summarize what we know, the current st uh, state of theology. Exploratory model is helping us discover either new aspects of the problem or aspects we have known but we have forgotten. So those two. Second, a good model must reflect the corporate existence, a corporate experience of the church. If it doesn't, it doesn't resonate, it's no good. So it has a second. The third characteristic of good model is that it somehow must impact upon one's spiritual life. It has to reshape one thinking, reshape one moral conversion, one spiritual religious conversion. So these are the three criteria I will use when I develop my own model of the church as a community of migration. The second part, again, seven, seven, eight pages here, I simply say this. We live in the age of migration. There is a very beautiful book, uh, one of the best book. The title is The Age of Migration. If you teach a course on migration, this is a book you have to buy and let the students study. So we all know through Pope Francis that migration is the sign of the time, besides others, ecological disaster and so forth, but migration is a sign of the time. In 2017, last year, the United Nations reported that there are 68.5 million refugees. Refugee meaning people forced to leave the country, across the country, because of war and, and violence. But in addition to these 68.5 million uh, refugees, there are also migrants. In 2010, there were over 200 million migrants. They had to force because of, of, uh, because of ecological disaster, because of flood like South North Carolina, because of food, shortage of food, because of everything they have to move, but they have no possibility of crossing borders. They move from, from city to city, from the uh, countryside to the city. The largest internally displaced persons, migrants within the country, is China. Over 150 million Chinese move. And nobody knows about it. Because when you talk about migration, you think always of refugees. But those people need help too. Well, in search of food, in search of housing, because of flood. The third type is the people who simply have to move because of any reason was look for a job. A student who goes to 
other countries. Marriage, they get married so they can go. You know. This child pride about. They, this is a huge number, over 370 million people. So all in all, if you count the internal uh, uh, refugees, you count the people who had to move because of uh, any reason, because of it, oh, almost a billion people out of seven billion humans on this world are so-called either refugees or migrants or internally displaced persons. So I said, but here are the thing. There are four fictions that when you talk about migration, you be very careful not to let yourself deceive into accepting them. First, mass migration did not happen in the 21st century for the first time. It has happened throughout human history. Just give you one example. When you look at the slave trade from the 18th, 19th century, 11 million Africans were sold into slavery either in the Atlantic or in South America and the Caribbean. This is huge. And nobody mentioned that. That's a form of forced migration, the largest forced migration ever, right? Again, if you look at the 19th century, the so-called gray migration from Europe to the United States. 200 million European move from Europe to here. That's migration. The largest free voluntary migration in the history of the world. So we are not, our time is not the first time that migration occurs. So we do have experience how to handle them. The second fiction is somehow we are now infected by migration. I use the word that Donald Trump used, no? infected. 85% of refugees, not migrants, 85% of refugees are settled in the so-called third world. You need to repeat that. 85% of them settle in the poorest country in the world. Turkey, Pakistan, Jordan, Lebanon, Uganda. The poorest country in the world. They shoulder the burden of the migrants. Not the wealthiest country in the north. Not in Europe, not in the United States. And you know this year, Donald Trump limited the number of migrants to 30,000. All the rest of the world pay. So we are not overrun by the, uh, the, the, the uh, migrants. The third is that we need to remember that we are, the West are responsible for migration. We are the cause. We talk as if migration happens somewhere else and we have nothing to do with it. Most migrations, refugees, are caused by the war initiated by the United States and the West, colonial power. We are responsible for it. And fourthly, migration is not simply a social, economic, political issue. It is a deeply spiritual and theological issue. And we are grateful for Pope Francis to remind us about. So these are the things I go quickly. So here I have another 15 pages to go for the rest of the evening. <laughs> and this I will read because of that. Now, with these reflections on migrant as background, we can now broach the question I raised above. Besides Dulles' six models of the church, is it possible, and perhaps even necessary, to explore another, one that is shaped by one of the most pervasive signs of the time, namely worldwide migration? This new model is not simply an addition, or the seventh model, to Dulles six. Rather, it assumes and integrates them given them a richer 
are a contour and a fuller meaning. So I will use the three criteria that knowledge use. First, it is explanatory and exploratory. Second, it reflects the corporate experience of the church. And third, it creates, it provides a spiritual conversion, a moral conversion, an intellectual conversion in the individual. For those living in the United States, that American Christianity was brought into existence by migration is a truism that need no historical elaboration. No survey of the historical origins, geographical expansions, demographic, demographic growth, and continual vitality of the American Christianity is needed to show that each and every American church, Catholic, Episcopalian, Protestant, Orthodox, Pentecostal, and Evangelical, was and continued to be indissolubly intertwined with the coming of waves of migrants into our shore. While this is true of all Christian denominations, here I limit myself to the American Catholic Church. Perhaps one fact alone would convince you if you have some doubt about this. In the Archdiocese of Los Angeles, Sunday Mass is celebrated in 42 languages, not counting Latin. Right? <laughs> yes, the language of man content, liturgical man content. In the Bronx, where Fordham University is located, at St. Lucy's Parish, Sunday Mass is set in five languages, English, Spanish, Italian, Albanian, and Creole, and of course, Latin. That's amazing. This is a small, tiny parish. In addition to founding the American Catholic Church, augmenting its demographics, and filling the pews on Sunday, migrants have increased the dwindling number of white male and especially female religious and priests. You go to Orange County, you go to Louisiana, New Orleans, so most of the priests are Vietnamese. And I was told that one time the Bishop of New Orleans wanted to put a moratorium on Vietnamese vocation because the white priests have now become a minority. He didn't want that to happen. Furthermore, Catholic migrants bring with them different ways of being Christian that enrich the mainly white form of American Christianity. You don't believe it? Go to any Vietnamese, Filipino mass. You go to the white mass, it's so vanilla type, you know? So, <laughs> so boring. You go to Vietnamese man, oh my God, music, the best music in the world, Kore uh, Korean and, and Filipino dancing and so forth. Of course, not counting the Mexican mass even more. Any decent history of the Catholic Church will supply facts and figures to flesh out this narrative. Given the essential contributions of Christian migrants, both the older European groups, notably Irish, Germans, Italian, Poles, and Czechs, and the more recent cohorts, particularly from Central and South America, Asia, and Africa, without whom there would have been no Christianity at all in the US, it is possible to advance a historical thesis, extra migrationem, Nulla Ecclesia Catholica Americana. First thesis. Actually, I have three, but this is the first one. Outside of migration, there is no American Catholic Church, period. We forget that. But that's the very roots of the American Catholic Church. Outside of migration, there is no Catholic Church at all.
I talk about the Catholic Church in the United States. But this principle now, so it reflects the corporate experience of the church. The first criteria, second criteria of Dulles. This historical thesis about North American Christianity being constituted by migrants can be enlarged to apply to the church universal itself. And this is much more controversial. Without migration, the church as a whole and Christianity as such would not exist as Catholic. No migration, no Catholicity. So it seemed to me that, the, therefore, this thesis, this is also historical thesis, but applied to the church as a whole, outside migration, there is no church as a global and Catholic small sea church. So this is the second Latin phrase this evening. <laughs> Extra migrationem nulla ecclesia. No church, no Christianity, if there's no migration, historically speaking. I don't refer to God or Spirit Christ, so I just simply historically so. To validate this thesis, we need to challenge the customary account of how Christianity spread throughout the globe in the course of the past two, two millennia. In this hierarchy-centered and Eurocentric church history, the geographical expansion of Christianity is attributed mainly, if not exclusively, to the work of the 12 apostles who laid the foundation of the true church, so apostolic succession, and to Christian missions, whose main agents were bishops, who are the success of the apostles, priests and religious. So this is a narrative that at least I was trained in and look at the older books of church history. I have a church historian sitting down there. If you look about 50, 60 years ago, you look at how, how this is how Christianity spread. Well, the 12 apostles and then their successors and the priests and religious. But what do we know about the 12 apostles? Not much. Where did they go? Peter? Or the other one? I suspect they went back to their wives and their family to have a cook meal, home cook meals. <laughs> we know nothing about it. Right? There is a story, St. Thomas went to India, but that's about it. So to be really historically uh, 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 Exact, you need to reflect, the, the, it's a mission. Uh, it's not carried out by priests and bishops. They were carried out by people who on the move. They move and they spread the gospel. All right? So little account is taken of the impact of mass migratory movements, which transform Christianity from a Jewish sect into a world religion and its Catholicity from an abstract dogma into a historical reality. It is the people on the move that brought Christianity around the world. It is not evangelization as such by bishop. It was by the gossiping of the gospel by the people who went around. It is, of course, impossible for me to provide a detailed rereading of the history of Christianity from the perspective of migration this evening. Here I can only offer the barest outline of 10 migrations that have stamped Christianity as a permanent institutional migrant. And each of these migrations produce a new face of the church. If there's any doctoral student in this room, this is what you can do. Rewrite your history from the perspective of migration. Forget council, forget papacy fighting with the empire, forget everything else. Just make migration as a perspective. You reread history. Every time you see migration shaping the church. So I go to the 10 of them. 
The first Christian migration, one that radically transformed Christianity from a Jewish sect into a worldwide migrant institution, occurred with the Jewish diaspora after the destruction of the temple in the year AD 70. The face of the church here is that the Jewish Christian migrants. That's the first phase of the church. The second migration. Following on the heels of this first migration was another exodus, much more extensive, of the Christian community out of Jerusalem and Palestine. The destruction of the temple and the subsequent suppression of the Jewish revolt in the year 115 and 17 and 132 and 135 caused migrations not only of Jews but also of Christians. Five areas were the destination of the second migration where Christianity began building churches, communities, eventually patriarchates. You have mission to Mesopotamia and the Roman province of Syria, Greece and Asia Minor, Western Mediterranean, Egypt and Asia, especially India. So you have this first two centuries, you have this most mass movement of Christianity out of Jerusalem, of Jerusalem into the five areas. And here the face of the church is of the Mediterranean and Syrian migrants. This is the face of the church, the second place. Third, migration, which had an enormous and permanent impact on the shape of the Christianity was occasioned by the Emperor Constantine transfer of the capital of the Roman Empire from Rome to Byzantium in the year 330, and the subsequent establishment of the imperial court at Constantinople, the so-called the New Second Rome. As a result, there were not only momentous geopolitical changes, but also a shift of the Christian center of gravity Gradually, there emerged a new and different type of Christianity, commonly known as Orthodox Christianity. Imagine this. This is not something the church did. It was political power that did it. Emperor who moved the capital down to uh, Turkey today. Imagine for a moment, Pope Francis says, next month, I want to move the capital of the, the center of the Catholic Church to New Jersey. God forbid, but that, that's <laughs> okay. Right? Imagine the transfer of all the bureaucracies, the Roman Curia, the Cardinal with their, no, with their friends and, and, and so forth, right? It's a huge, it transformed Christianity. It's a new phase of the church, Orthodox Christianity. And from there, they move, as you know, move to uh, 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 Eastern Europe and then up to Russia and so forth. The fourth migration. In early Christianity was a migration of Germanic tribes, which include the Vandals, the Goths, the Alemanni, the Anglers, the Saxons, the Burgundians, and Lombards. The Vandals, the Goths from Ostrogoths and Visigoths, and the Lombard invaded southern and eastern Europe, particularly Spain, whereas the Anglers and the Saxons spread to the British Isles. Once converted to Christianity, these Germanic tribes produced a church we call Teutonic Church, Germanic Church, which is very different from the Roman Church. But every time migration produced a new Christianity, without migration, we don't have this global, but it was Catholic Christianity. The fifth migration, which radically altered the map of Christendom, coincided with the so-called discovery of the new world during the age of discovery under the royal patronage of Spain and Portugal, during which Christian missions were carried out in the largest scale ever. From the end of the 15th century, the two Iberian countries competed with each other in discovering and occupying new lands outside Europe. Once again, it was migration, the movement of massive numbers of religious missionaries and secular Europeans to Latin America and Asia that built up the new form of Christianity, 
which, although at first heavily marked by European Christian traditions, eventually developed distinctive ways of being Christians that reflect the cultures and religious traditions of the old indigenous people. Think of this. Without this migration, we wouldn't have Latin American Christianity. We wouldn't have Asian Christianity. And so very different from the European older Tridentine Christianity. Number six, from about 1650 to the First World War, 1914-1918, migration played an increasingly vital role in modernization and industrialization of world economy. Warfare, conquest, the emergence of empire and nation states, and Europe's search for new wealth produced enormous migrations, both voluntary and forced. By the 19th century, other European powers joined the commercial and colonizing project started by Portugal and Spain, France, Belgium, Germany, Great Britain, Italy, Holland, vie with each other for the scramble of Africa. That is another Christianity. That's these people moving, and that's the 19th century. Christianity, very different from the Asian Christianity. It's a scramble for Africa, with most African countries, except Liberia and Ethiopia, falling under the domination of Europe. Almost all Asian countries, too, were colonized. Between 1800 and 1915, an estimated 50 to 60 million Europeans moved overseas destination, huge migration of European into the, the other side. And by 1915, an estimated 15% of Europeans live outside of Europe. Again, it is the massive migration of Europeans to Africa and Asia that together with a large number of missionaries, especially Protestant now, expanded Christianity in ways hitherto unimaginable and produced new forms of Christianity that eventually bear little resemblance to the European churches. Seven, the seven migration was brought about by the transatlantic slave which from the 16th to the 19th century brought over 12 million Africans, the largest and the most brutal forced migration in history, to the Americas and transformed Christianity on this continent. After the slave trade was abolished during the 19th century, the scarcity of cheap labor was, uh, cheap labor was made up by the globe-spanning migrations of indenture from China and India, the coolie trade. Millions of them. Since the 1980s, around 30 mission indentures workers, 30 million indentured workers immigrated from India. The face of the church of this face is of European colonialism. The people they conquered, especially Asians and Africans and slaves. The Eighth Migration. It is often known as the Great Migration. Driven out of Europe by poverty, unemployment, a dream of better life, more than 50 million Europeans migrated to the U.S. And then they come in here, they start moving from the east to the west, the gold rush. And the same thing with the movement of the migration of the African black soccer from the north, south to the north, creating a new Christianity, totally new Christianity, not the, the white Christianity, Protestant Christianity, it's the black Christianity with their worship, their hymns, their, their uh, uh, ecclesiastical traditions. Nine. World War II, more than any other armed conflicts, caused large-scale worldwide migrations. After the war, massive migration were also spawned by events such as decolonization, which was accompanied by return of former colonies to their countries of origin, and then by the coming of the, the colonized to, to France, to Germany, to Holland, uh, to England, and so forth. 
So the African continent was in full transformation as well. The wars of anti-colonial liberation, the establishment of dictatorial regimes, the exploitation of mineral riches, South Africa, the apartheid system, the regional, interregional, and tribal conflicts produced a steady stream of refugees and migrants. The face of the church here is the Mike church in the diaspora. Number 10. The 10th migration is taking place in our own day, in the last 50 years. And the last 50 years has been called the age of migration. Wars, violent conflicts, especially in the Middle East, the wars in Iraq, Afghanistan, Lebanon, Syria caused massive migration. In particular, the Iraq war wrought havoc upon the most ancient centers of Christianity, reducing to rubbles. And again, you see, today we are facing this. Okay. So here's my thesis, simplest thesis. You look at the 10 migration throughout history, you see that the church became Catholic small, universal global. So my second thesis is that outside the church, outside migration, there is no church. The third thesis, outside migration, there is no salvation. Now that, that's strange. So extra migrationum nulla ecclesia americana. Extra migrationum nulla ecclesia, no Christians. But can you say outside migration there is no salvation? Extra migrationum nulla salus. So here I am, do I have how many more minutes? Almost finished? Yeah, okay. <laughs> so I jump. It seems to me that the uh, experience of Christians in the early church is that it is through migration that they spread. More than that, they identified themselves as migrants. If you look at patristic literature, the word, the self-description of migrant is that they are migrants. In describing the Christian migrant, early Christian writers had at their disposal three biblical words, stranger, foreigner, and sojourner. This is how they identify themselves. If you look at the letter to the Diognetus, the anonymous, this is what they claim to be, a migrant, a sojourner, a stranger. This self-consciousness of Christians as foreigners, strangers, and sojourners is found in the claimants of Rome letter to the Christian in Corinth. It was sent, I quote, from the church of God, which sojourned in Rome to the church of God, which sojourned in Corinth, migrants. Polycarp, the bishop martyr of Smyrna, also addressed his letter to the Christian in Philippi, I quote, to the church of God, which resides as a stranger, Parakusai, in Philippi. Similarly, the materium of Polycarp was sent, quote, from the church of God, which resides as a stranger, Paroikusa, at Smyrna, to the church of God, residing as a stranger in Philomene. It's amazing how, if you read with the eyeglasses of migration, you see how the Christians, early Christians, describe themselves as migrants, greeting from church of migrant to church. Okay? So tomorrow, if you see the bishops of, uh, Los, uh, of, 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 of New York, don't call him the cardinal. Call him the migrant in chief. That's what he is. He's a migrant in chief. Thank you. Yeah.
in uh, your talk, you develop the idea of conceiving of the church as a church of migrants or as a migrant church along the lines of how Avery develops the other models in, in it. <clears throat> and I very much appreciated that, and I thought you did it very well, even though you didn't get to, to um, deliver it here. I discovered that um, um, one of the, just to pick up from your very last, last point, when people refer to the church as a pilgrim church, they often think of the word pilgrim as meaning people who are on their way to a religious shrine. And so you get the notion of the people moving towards the shrine. But the original meaning precisely, uh, peregrinus, the, Latin, the adjective in Latin, peregrinus means a stranger, a person who is living outside his or her homeland. And I bring that up in, in part because I think that you'd find also confirmation of your view, in particular, in the books of uh, John Eliot on the epistle, um, uh, first epistle of St. Peter, where <clears throat> Eliot argues that the metaphor of the church as a group of, of um, paroikoi is not meant metaphorically, but that it refers actually to people who were migrants in uh, and that he was addressing. In any case, I, liked, I very much liked your presentation. Um, my first acquaintance with Avery Dulles came around 1969 or 1970 when Woodstock College moved from rural Maryland to Manhattan and affiliated with Union Theological Seminary and with Jewish Theological Seminary. As we noted before, the move was controversial and the experiment did not last very long. At that time, I was teaching at Dunwoody, the major seminary of the Archdiocese of New York, and had just begun doctoral studies at Union. At some point, for one of my directed reading courses, I wrote two small papers on the notion of authority and its exercise. Avery kindly read them and recommended that I have them published. I had not, I think I might have published one article before this, and I muttered something about not being sure that anything I wrote was worth being published. And Avery replied to me, screwing up his face the way he could, I seem to have the opposite problem. <laughs> <laughs> this was also the time when the Berrigan brothers were regularly in the news. I remarked to Avery that perhaps Daniel's example might lead to an increase in vocations to the Jesuits. Avery replied, I certainly hope not. <laughs> Avery's politics were far closer to his father's and to his uncle's than <laughs> to the Berrigans. When a dozen years later we became colleagues at Catholic University, his suite of rooms was on the same floor of Caldwell Hall as my office, and so we had regular contact, and we also collaborated often on various committees and dissertation committees. There was one fu fi uh, funny moment. Uh, I had a colleague in our department, uh, Sister Catherine Dooley, Lord have mercy on her beautiful soul, but she was uh, one day went, da went down the hall um, to the supply room to get something out of the supply room and encountered Avery, whose rooms were right next to the supply room. And anyway, she's chatting away with Avery there and putting the key in the, in the door and keeps talking, talking until finally Avery says, do you have some particular reason you want to get into my bedroom? <laughs> she had mistaken the door. Avery drove a big whale of a car, which rumors said he had inherited from his uncle, Alan Dulles, former director of the Central Intelligence Agency during the 1950s. The car was big, huge, heavy looking, probably got about nine miles a gallon. Okay. <laughs> that it was easy to believe that it was bulletproof and Avery put a sticker on the rear bumper that read, Fly Dulles. So, <laughs> when he was made a cardinal, friends, colleagues, and admirers were delighted, but we also looked forward to the day when we could see him in procession among his fellow cardinals, most of whom are plumper, were plumper than he was, 
to see him dressed in a cardinal's finery, settling the question what Abraham Lincoln would have looked like in scarlet. <laughs> George Weigel told me that he, he told that little nugget to John Paul II, <clears throat> who took great delight in the quip. When Avery began making use of the comparison of models in the early 1970s, I told him that I found it very useful, very helpful, but that I hoped that someday, instead of describing and assessing the positions of other theologians, he would sit down to write his own systematic work. He never attempted that, at least not in ecclesiology, and after models, most of his books were collections of essays already published elsewhere, the great exception being his book on Catholicity, which originated as a series of co coherent and commissioned lectures. The reason for this, I think, had something to do with his personal modesty. It was interesting, Kathy Hilker told the story of his asking her uh, for advice as to what to read. He did that on many, many topics. He would come to his colleagues. He said that one of the reasons he enjoyed being at Catholic University is that he had so many colleagues who were experts in other fields than he was in, and he would regularly go to them and say, all right, I'm, I'm thinking of doing something in this. Can you give me a basic bibliography? So there was tremendous uh, modesty, personal modesty. But he also, I think, had um, the reason I, I don't think he ever went on to try to write a, a systematic work is that he had a very modest view of systematic theology. You will recall that in Models of the Church, he used a somewhat disparaging term, supermodel, for a view that would try to combine the virtues of each of the five other models without suffering their limitations. And he expressed his skepticism that one could find any one model that would be truly adequate for the church is essentially a mystery. And he said, we are therefore condemned to work with models that are inadequate to the reality to which they point. I have long disagreed with that view of systematic theology. It's not, of course, because I deny that the church is a mystery, nor do I maintain that it is possible here below, and perhaps also not in the kingdom, to construct a theology of the church that exhausts its intelligibility. But I think that a systematic theologian can legitimately strive for the least inadequate vision of the church, that is, one that does try to combine the virtues of other views and to suffer as few limitations as they can and fewer limitations than any one of the others. I think that this requires a method that is more than a comparison or a dialectical, dialectical contrasting of models and entails trying to overcome the plurality of models in a synthetic vision. In 1999, Avery and I exchanged lengthy letters on this and on another point, whether one may speak of the church as sinful. I cannot say that we convinced each other. And Avery came to think that the differences between us were getting so narrow as not to be worth debating. I think he probably also got tired of reading five-page, single-spaced, small print letters from me. He also thought that we were working with somewhat different epistemological presuppositions. He working more out of Newman and especially Polanyi while I worked more directly out of Lonergan. I myself think that there was something too that we worked with different epistemological presuppositions. <clears throat> one, of, one of which was that I, I thought that he thought that people were um, almost condemned to work within a model. And I didn't think that was true. I don't think that we necessarily think in terms of root metaphors or in terms of images. And um, I suppose that's in part because I sat down and tried to figure out whatever, what, <laughs> what the root metaphor might be that's infested my mind. So I, I think there was a, a difference there. So I always remained disappointed that he did not make an effort to go beyond the variety of models to attempt his own synthesis of a particular theological theme. 
but I do not, do not mean by that, by, by that to diminish the importance of what he was able to achieve. And here is how I described it when he was named a cardinal. Father Dulles's work has largely been marked by a commitment to conversation, which of course involves listening as much as it does speaking. And he has been a good listener, first in the sense that he has attended to the voices of the past in large works on the history of theology. He's attended to the voices of separated Christians in several ecumenical dialogues and to fellow Catholics in analyses of post-conciliar church life and theology. Sympathetic, sympathetic listening was also one of the rules which Father Dulles learned from St. Ignatius Loyola at the beginning of the spiritual exercises, and I quote, let it be presupposed that every good Christian is more ready to save his neighbor's proposition than to condemn it. Let it be presupposed that every good Christian is more ready to save his neighbor's proposition than to condemn it. That is an assumption that is the opposite of the odium theologicum that too often poisons the atmosphere of the church. I had a friend who went to a psychologist and the psychologist, he was having some difficulty, and the psychologist said to him, listen, you're very aggressive. The next time you, you have a, um, an argument, you got into a discussion with someone, instead of attacking right away, say, there's a lot of truth in what you say. And then express that, and then you can do your criticisms. So I said, well, that's a pretty good idea. I think I'll try that. I had no difficulty with this method when it was something I didn't care about. <laughs> when it was something I cared about, I went right for the jugular. You know, so. But I do think that, that the, the method of models attempts to do that, to take what other people have said and to, first of all, say what can be said in favor of it. And that that really explains why he went out of his way in the, in the first decade, keep in mind that the book came out in the first decade after the council, to try to bring some order into the confusion of people. If you, if you think about how long the paradigm of scholastic theology had prevailed in the church, now, it's certainly post-Reformation, but say, you could say for 150, 200 years, the scholastic paradigm had prevailed. Within 10 years of the council, the thing had collapsed. And nothing paradigmatic, meaning governing the whole sphere, was taking its place. And so Avery's book was designed to bring some order into this and to try to trace differences, the more obvious differences, back to more, uh, to, deep, to deeper causes, to prior decisions and to get people to start thinking about, that, about them. So I think there is a sense in which that retains its validity. And it is in its own way somewhat similar to the medieval question, questio, the sic et non technique that was the incredibly fruitful driving force of theological progress during the Middle Ages, where you have authorities and arguments lining up on this side to say yes in answer to a question, and you have theological arguments and, and authorities on this side which respond no to it. So now you've got a question. These people say yes, these people say no. How do you deal with this? And I used to give my graduate students a, 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 um, a requirement to write a paper setting out the sick et non on some issue that they were really interested in. And I said, don't choose one you, know, you don't care about. Choose something that you care about that you know is disputed within the church. And be objective and fair with no calumni calumniating adjectives or adverbs. Set down, th these are the people here who are in favor of the ordination of women. These are the people here who are opposed to the ordination of women. Do it objectively. You have the sick and you've got the non. Now, start looking in. What do they differ on? Where do they differ? 
and if you can trace that back, and then tell me what you have to learn. This, is, this was an introductory course. Tell me what you have to learn in order to be able to settle the issue and do, do something more than flip a coin up in the air or go with your gut. I think that's what Avery, Avery's book was doing in one sense. That's a kind of a, a dialectic that, that uh, and it, it, it was and it remains very, very useful. His, it was sometimes said, as it's already been pointed out, that Avery tended to be conservative when he was among liberals and liberal when he was among conservatives. I think there was something to that. And I think this was always something more than a simple impish desire to prevent anyone from becoming too comfortable in his own stance, which is not a bad role to play. Okay. If you're among the people who are smugly confident, it doesn't hurt to go. Thing. If later it became, it seemed that he was more often to find it, he, he found himself more often on the conservative side, I think, and probably that was in part because he thought that a certain liberal paradigm that was most in need to, of being challenged, at least in theological circles. In any case, perhaps his own example might lead us to question the adequacies of those, those categories of liberal and conservative, since they are often used as an excuse not to follow St. Ignatius's rule, as it might seem, and is, more, is not as commonly followed as one might have desired to see happen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professors Kamanchek and Fan. Um, did we collect any questions? We're going to have a chance for the two of them to talk a little bit first. If you have questions and you haven't written a question yet, you can still do so. We have some time. Testing again. <clears throat> Testing again. <clears throat> Testing again. Okay. Yes. While we're getting organized, speaking of um, Father Dulles, at, as I knew him at Catholic University, um, living on the third floor of Caldwell, uh, seminarians who were friends of mine um, tell the story about. Father Dulles allowing them to place their papers that were due for class under his door, but that had to be by a certain time, say 10 o'clock at night. And so one of my friends talks about the fact that the two, two of these seminarians had their papers and it was 10.20. So they walk very quietly down the hall and they see that the light is still on, so they push the papers under and they run down the hall. And as they're running to the end of the hall, they hear a voice from the other end of the hall saying, zero. <laughs> There's that impish, that impishness. All right, we have some good questions here, but before we get into them, is there anything you'd like to say to each other? Well, uh, I agree with you very much that the, uh, the model kind of doing theology through models 
can be, um, as you said, put the yes and a no, and then try to mediate the two of them. Uh, the strength and the greatest thing I find about the model is that it recognizes the plurality of uh, ways of looking at things. And I think that's what allows us this evening, this afternoon, this evening, to go beyond what <coughs> he has said, but follow his insight. Mm -hmm. the, the, the sixth principle you mentioned this morning, uh, uh, Elizabeth, is the kind of thing that we simply put, this is what we do, and then we gather in new insights. I think that's the strength beyond what you were saying that we were trying to mediate in a moment of theological chaos in the post to era and find some light. I find it really, it's just uh, exploratory. It, it allow us to go further on and find out some models as family or as uh, harmony of yin and yang or as, as migrant. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think he says somewhere in models that he's not pretending that these are the only five mm -hmm. models. I yeah, mean, I did. Yeah. There are some people who think they came down with the Ten Commandments. <laughs> 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 But, you know, so that's, that's extremely important. So I thought that the three or four new quotes and quotes models or images that we heard today were useful. And when I say that I, I um, when I used to give my criticism of this and saying, he, you know, he doesn't have a view of a theology as a synthetic vision of a particular theological area, um, people would say, so you think that there is a one one vision of the church. And I said, no, I don't think that there's one vision of the church, but I do think that a theologian has a right to try to sit down mm -hmm. and to write a synthetic um, theology of the church. And that, you know, we don't have to remain with a plurality. So, of them. one of the criticism I had of Avery was that it, it seemed to me that he conflated images and models mm -hmm. too often. There's one place in, in the first chapter of, of models where he says, um, a, a model is an image that a has use been of subject religion. to his, to critical and I forget what the other adjective was, mm -hmm. critical systematic thought or something mm -hmm. like that. But he often slipped from one to the other. Mm -hmm. And he'd say, well, it, you, you know, you need a plurality of images. Well, the fact that you need a plurality of images doesn't necessarily mean you need a plurality of models. Um, images I, I took to mean first order discourse, whereas a model mm -hmm. was something on a more systematic or critical, mm -hmm. critical level. So let's get to some of these good questions that you all have given in. Thank you very much. Um, first to Professor Fan, um, sort of a double question. You propose a mo model of the church that's based in a, a concrete experience that right. people are having mm -hmm. on the ground of the church. Do you see this, the questioner asked, as a departure from, car from the mo model's approach of Cardinal Dulles, which seems to be more ideal type oriented? And if so, um, you know, what would you make of that? And then a second question, can you give us an example of how your church, your model of migratory church might actually occasion a change in some structure of the sure, church? So sort right, of a dual right. question. Um, that's something I wrote there, but uh, I, I answer immediately your question. Um, I do not think that the model of church as migrant substitutes the five or six model, eventually six model of Avery Dulles. I think at the end of his life, he tried to make discipleship as a sort of an overall, overarching mm -hmm. way of relating the other five. You can be an institution, but the institution of disciples. Uh, what I developed in my paper, which I didn't have the time to do it, is that the model of migration supplates, kind of out heaven, kind of supplates and integrate the other five. Imagine, if you say the second question, imagine if you are the church of institution model, but these are not made up of people in authority, but people who are migrants. Mm -hmm. What kind of institution that would be? Mm -hmm. You can imagine all kinds of things. And if you say, well, the church is a model of communion, but these communions are not just simply of ordinary people. They are the majority of them are migrants who come from, let's say, Mexico or Syria or something. How do you understand communion with these people? Mm -hmm. Diversity of cultures, they are not white. They are not necessarily Catholic in the same types. 
So how do you understand the word communion in that sense? The same thing with herald, preaching. How do you preach to the migrants? What kind of language you use? Liturgy, worship, how do you see the Eucharist on Sunday? I, I give an example. When the priests say, bless you, Lord, for good all creation, for this prayer to offer through the earth and human hands, whose hands are you talking about? The Mexicans. Those are hands that make the bread. The wine, fruit the wine, and fruit of the vine, who walk of human hands, who walk of human hands. It's not just everybody. In this country, the Mexican who gather the fruit, who make, the woman who make the bread. That's human hand, not in the abstract. So for me, it's just to make the five morals of uh, Abraham, I make it more historically rooted than just simply in the abstract. The same thing, if I may say so. Uh, the chapter of Lumen Gentium talks about the Birkham Church. You read it? It's so abstract. <laughs> church moving towards the kingdom of God. No, no, no. <laughs> the real migrants who uh, escape into the desert, who run to the high sea, who run the risk of dying, of thirst, of hunger, and of those, this is the church migrant church, as you said, the Peregrinos. It's just a, going to a, 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 a Madonna, the shrine, the, right. shrine, the Madonna, or something. But these are the real people. So the historical uh, rootedness of these five models need to be explored more. And would you, just to follow up on the question, or would you say then that if we imagine the church and think of it in this concrete way, mm -hmm. that even the way we enact the structures of the church or we enact uh, our practices in the church are bound to change? Absolutely. We, yeah. Even our ethics will be changed. Mm -hmm. What is the greatest virtue we need today? Hospitality, the virtue that we've done. But hospitality say, oh, I am rich, I can take care of you. No, it's an exchange of gifts. Mm -hmm. We don't give them. We receive the gift from the market they brought to us. Mm -hmm. So hospitality is not simply generosity of the heart. Mm -hmm. It's our willingness to accept otherness, other gifts are different from mine. Mm -hmm. So it's a very different way of understanding uh, uh, hospitality, and you take the migrants as, the, the, as the, the persons. And I would say your point about the permanency of migration in making up as the American, but just the Catholicity of the church also responds to it. I've heard the objection, well, hospitality usually means someone comes, but yeah. then they leave. Mm -hmm. You know, I could be hospital to, to you for a week, but then you're going to leave. But when we talk about migrants, yeah, right. they come and they, they don't necessarily leave. But you're talking about in a bigger picture, that movement is always going right, on. Right, right. It's always going on, you know. Um, here's one for you, Father Kramanchek. Can you say more about your dispute with Avery Dulles about the sinful church, the sinfulness of the church? <laughs> we would like to settle that tonight, if possible. <laughs> Avery um, came close to the position of Charles Journet, um, mm -hmm. which has become almost canonical in Roman circles in the last uh, 30, 40 years, namely that the church herself is without sin, but not without sinners. And um, he wanted to maintain a vision of the church, in, in particular, whose holiness, and this is correct, whose holiness consists in the divine gifts of word and grace, sacraments. Um, and that's the, that's the first meaning of why the church is mm -hmm. holy. Not be, it's not an ethical, it's mm -hmm. not an ethical right. category, um, but a theological category. But these gifts don't exist in themselves. These gifts exist as received and as lived out by people. So I wanted to follow um, Augustine and Aquinas both of whom said that the day that the church will be without spot and wrinkle will be the kingdom, in the kingdom. But that meanwhile, and the two texts that Augustine constantly linked together in response to 
the Donatists claim that the church is already without spot mm -hmm. or wrinkle are if we say that we are without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us from 1 John 1. Mm -hmm. And forgive us our, and the church having to pray every day, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. If the church has to pray, and the church, he says, the whole church prays this. If the church has to pray this every day, it's because there are trespasses that need to be forgiven. And so I want, as I always try to do, is to say when people make a statement about the church, I want to know of whom it's true, in whom it's true. Which many people don't seem to be interested mm -hmm. in. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm serious about that. You find all kinds of people making all kinds of statements about the church, whether for good or for ill. Mm -hmm. And I want to say, who are you talking about? when you use the word church. church. The first meaning of the word church is that it's a group of human beings. Which human beings are you talking about when you say the church is holy, mm -hmm. the church is without sin? And if you can't point to anybody who's without sin or any group of people who's without sin, then the church is not without sin. So I, I, I'm more interested in what Augustine had to say, and, and I, I'm, more, I'm more inclined to what Augustine had to say than what uh, Charles Jouanet did. <laughs> what do you think? What, what, what is the stake that what I take you're saying Avery Dulles's viewpoint was in holding on to that notion of the sinlessness of the church? You know, what is the, what's the reason that that is held on to? I'm not a systematic theologian, so. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that. it has something to do with, with viewing the church as something more than the sum total of Christians. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you often hear people saying, well, you know, the church is more than the sum of its members. And I, I say, well, yes, so is the um, committee on tenure at the university. <laughs> what, what is this something more that the church is than the sum of its members? And then you have to bring in the constitutive role of faith, hope, and love, constitutive mm -hmm. church found, founding, mm -hmm. grace of God, and word of God. Um, that's what accounts for the church being more than the sum of its members. But it, it's a, the idea, persistent idea, that the, by the word church you mean something that is above no. all the members of the church, sort of halfway between God and us. And that it's that entity, suprapersonal entity, that is holy and not act, the actual communities of the faithful throughout mm -hmm. the world. Yeah, isn't this kind of conversation is so pertinent today, given what's happening in the church, yeah. the sexual scandals, and all that, for someone to stand up on in the church on Sunday and say the church is holy, only the people are sinful. <laughs> it doesn't ring true at all, and I think we are confronted with these scandals that that that, that in. Penetrate into the very life and structure and the way we minister and everything. You just can't say, as like you say, the church is holy up there and somehow only the sinners down here. So I think the conversation is so uh, uh, apropos given the situation we find ourselves today in the church. If you want to see one uh, uh, presentation of it also, but it, look at Louis Bouillet's book, The Church of. Church of. The, 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 It's his big, his big fat yeah. book that's been republished by Ignatius uh, Press. It's, um, it's been too much neglected, but towards the end he has a section on this question. It's the only, only ecclesiologist I know who said, all right, the question we're raising here is the intersection of the divine and the human in the church. And then he goes through the sacraments, through um, preaching, and through... Uh, governance in the church mm -hmm. and says, what's the, inter what's the interplay between the divine and the human in these three areas? And I, it, it, was, it comes down to being very, very mm -hmm. concrete. You know, sac sacraments, you have the most because you have the divine efficacy in the sacraments, which, thank God, don't depend upon our virtue. Um, it's, it's far more involvement of the divine and the human in preaching, and God knows it's present in the question of governance of the church. Which, which brings the issue back, you know, back down to the earth. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, 
Speaking of being brought back down to the earth, um, we've had a wonderful day here and an evening here of, of uh, kind of bringing heaven and earth together by, uh, by celebrating this person who is no longer physically with us, but is with us in the communion of saints, to go back to the beginning, and also the rich scholarship that was around him but has come through him and is moving forward into the 21st century. Um, as we all humbly, as he did, try to understand this mystery of the church and our place in the world as believers um, or citizens in relationship to it. So I want to thank both of our speakers very much. Um, mm -hmm. On behalf of all the organizers, we want to thank all of you, those of you who have spent the day with us, those of you who are just here for this evening. Um, we hope you have found this as enriching as, uh, as I know I have. So thank you all for being here, yeah. and have a good evening. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I find